Hey everyone, in today's video, we're gonna be talking about six of the top cover call ETFs to buy on the Canadian market. Now, before going into these six cover call ETFs and talking a bit more about them, their dividends, what they're owning, what their management fees are, I just wanna talk about covered call ETFs at large for a minute. So a covered call ETF is an ETF that holds a collection of stocks. Typically, these stocks have pretty solid dividends to begin with, but then on top of that, they, they sell covered calls. So essentially, they're selling the option to other investors to buy these stocks at a certain price point that is higher than the stock is today. So if the stock goes up a lot, um, that person that bought that covered call will act on that purchase and you may lose some of the upside in the appreciation of the underlying equities, but in return, you'll get the premiums and those premiums are what those other investors are buying for the option to buy your company um, from you at that higher price point. So those premiums plus the naturally high dividend get combined and end up paying usually pretty hefty dividend yields out to investors. So when you take a step back, a cover call ETF is essentially selling lots of the potential upside in the equities you're holding in the ETF in return for more cash flow now and having a higher payout now. So you're essentially sacrificing future capital gains for short-term dividends. So this works really well for people who are looking for high cash flow, for people who may be retired, um, looking to be living off of their investments and wanting that high monthly dividend yields. And I'll talk about what I use cover calls for a bit later in the video as well once we wrap up. But enough about cover calls in general. I want to jump right into the first one here. So the first cover call ETF I want to talk about is the Evolve Global Healthcare Enhanced Yield ETF. This company owns lots of global healthcare companies. We'll go into what they exactly own in a minute. First, I just want to look at their performance here. So this company's actually been flat over the last year, and I think they pay about a 9% dividend. So you've been getting a decent return over the last year. Over the last five years, the company's performed pretty well, up about 7.5%. And typically you'd say, hey, if the stock's only up 7.5%, that's not really great performance over a five-year period. But on these covered call ETFs, as long as you can hold flat, the dividend yields you tend to get are like 7, 10, 11%. So that's really where all your returns coming. As long as the ETF holds flat, you will end up in an okay total shareholder return standpoint. Looking into some more details on the CTF here, you'll see here the type of stocks that they own in the underlying equities. So lots of global healthcare companies like we were talking about, AbbVie, Novartis, J&J, &J, Merck, Eli Lilly, etc. So just scrolling through, those are kind of their top positions. I think they own about 30 positions in total. Looking at um, their annual distribution yield, they're about 9% and they own 20, not 30. So 20 um, positions in total here in their portfolio. They have a 0.45% management fee, which to be honest for a cover call ETF is actually pretty, pretty reasonable. Some of these get pretty high up 0.7, 0.8%. We'll look at some of those later. But the reality is unlike an S&P 500 ETF where there's no active management in these ETFs, they're actively going in, deciding what cover calls to sell and, and whatnot. So they're managing this account a lot more than, than, a, typical, um, than a typical ETF may do that's a bit more passive. So looking at a bit more information on this company here. You can see their geographical allocation across accounts. So they're very heavily dominated in the US. But what I'd say is lots of these US companies like Pfizer, et cetera, they operate globally. So this is a bit misleading in terms of where the companies sit and where they're traded versus where those underlying companies actually do business. So I think their diversification is a bit understated by that chart right there. And here you can kind of get a, a sense just for what some of those um, other companies outside of the U.S. are. You got Novo there, you got um, Sanofi, um, you got Novartis, which sits in Switzerland. So you get some global diversification out of this one too. But I think lots of people probably own this company here for that dividend yield that we are talking about off the top 
um, let me get back to it here, of 9%. So in the last year, you've gotten that 9% dividend yield, about 1% capital appreciation, so about 10% return um, after you paid the 0.5 or 0.45% management fee. So that's the Evolve Global Healthcare ETF. A good play just if you want healthcare for the yield, but you don't really care about the upside or you just want to manage the volatility of the equity. The good thing about these ETFs is when the stocks go down, you still get the premium from selling the upside. So in an environment that the stocks are going down and equities are going down, you actually tend to get better total shareholder returns with these covered call ETFs as opposed to owning just the straight up equity. Okay, going into the second uh, covered call ETF we're going to be talking about today, it is the Harvest Equal Weight Global Utilities Income ETF. So similar to how um, to how in l the first company we talked about, Ticker Life, um, it had all of the healthcare companies. This ETF here has a lot of global utility companies within them. So I'm just going to take you guys through some of their um, mix here. So top 10 investments here. They have some U.S. presence like Kinder Morgan, etc. They also have a lot of Canadian presence in here. You see Rogers, you see Enbridge, um, some other businesses you may be familiar with. In terms of the types of utilities they're invested in, I like the diversification here, about 30% in electric, 35% in telecom, um, multi-utilities that do more than one, so like Enbridge probably, 10% there, wireless, telecom six, gas three, um, and so forth and, and, and whatnot. So you get a pretty good mix of different types of utilities. It's not just telecom, it's not just gas, it's not just oil, um, et cetera. You're, you're kind of all over the, the map in terms of uh, what type of exposure you're getting. Looking at the type of businesses that they're focused on and that build into that, you can kind of get a sense for the industries that they hold stocks in and, and where they're focused on. So it is still renewable energy. It is still water purification to some extent. So they are getting a pretty broad range of utilities that they hold in this um, ETF. And I think they just make the case for, hey, long term energy consumption is going to continue to go up. Population and the requirement for energy to have a productive society and, and to continue to develop the world is going to continue to be in higher and higher demand. So the underlying equities are in a good position is kind of the case that, that they're making here. In terms of the management fee, management fee on this one, similar to Life, uh, is 0.5% on ticker HUTL, H-U-T-L, which is the utilities ETF here. You get a pretty nice dividend, 12 cents a share, so multiply that by 12, about a buck 50 a share on a share price of $16. So there you go, you're getting almost 10% dividend yield in this one as well. As you can see though, unlike the first ETF here, on uh, the Harvest Equal Weight Global Utilities ETF, the stock's actually gone down about 12%. And if I look over the last five years, it's down about 20%. Now, this has been because lots of the underlying stocks haven't performed too great. Um, with interest rates going up and whatnot, there's been a lot of downwards pressure on lots of these sectors that they're playing in within utilities. Lots of these companies hold a lot of debt to begin with. Um, let me just refresh this, but hold a lot of debt to begin with. So the fact that interest rates are going up, giving investors alternative places to park money uh, for those yields, but also from an operating standpoint, putting pressure on lots of these utilities companies who need to be servicing those debts. So long term, I think these companies will do well. As interest rates go down, I think they'll go up. But even in the last five years, with a minus 20% return on the share price, the dividend of seven, eight, nine percent a share, you'd still end up with a total return of about five percent on average a year. So not tremendous, but not bad return given that it's a space that's come under some pressure over the last five years. Going into the third stock here, and this page needs to be <laughs> reset as well, it is the Canadian High Dividend Cover Call ETF. So over the last year, this one's down about 7%. This company here, ticker ZWC, is a cover call ETF run by BMO, who does a handful of them in Canada. They do have pretty high management fees, which we'll get at in a second. But this essentially has a basket of high-paying Canadian dividend stocks Looking at the portfolio over the last six years here, you can see $10,000 would have grown into 
about $13,000, $13,500. So you have been getting a decent return. Management fee here, these are the ones that are on the higher end and that make me cringe a little bit, but all the way up to about 0.7% management fees that you have to pay in order to get access to this ETF. Over the, the long term here, you can see their returns, three-year return of about 12% a year, since inception about 5%. So the stock has gone down, but the, the premiums and dividends have made up for it and you've gotten at least um, a decent, not great, but decent uh, return of about 5% since it was created about six years ago. In terms of the sectors, this is going to look really close to what the Canadian economy is, uh, just because it, it's all Canadian um, blue chip stocks for the most part. See a lot of financials, energy, communications, and then as it dwindles off, you get some materials, utilities, etc. Top holdings, lots of banks, you got CN Rail in there, Bell, Manulife, Canadian National Resources, Enbridge, so lots of just the biggest Canadian companies naturally are at the top. And then this just shows you kind of the, the, the credit ratings and, and whatnot from an ESG standpoint on, on the business. But looking at um, the company a bit more in depth here, you're getting an 8% dividend yield on this one. So slightly less than life or, or huddle. Uh, and you're paying a bit more of a management fee. So this is one that lots of people who invest heavily in Canada already may have less use for if you already have 80% of your portfolio in Canadian stocks, maybe you're better suited, assuming you are striving for diversification, to invest in ticker life or ticker huddle. Um, but if you don't, or if you just want um, to have a total ETF strategy across your portfolio, um, this would be a good one just to mimic the Canadian market, despite the high management fees, which is something you should definitely be aware of before um, investing in any ETF. Okay, going on to the next ETF here, and it is another BMO cover call ETF. This one is specifically on the Canadian banking system. So Canadian banks over the last year have been in a bit of a tough spot. Going to refresh this page as well. Um, but because of that, you can see that the stock over the last year has been trending downwards. When we go into them over the long term, though, Canadian banks long term have always done Pretty well. So you see here, ten thousand dollars twelve years ago has turned into twenty five thousand dollars today, with the dividend yields being paid out. So it's performed pretty well over the long term. But you can see here, since about twenty twenty or so, um, it's down about fifteen twenty percent from then. So at the end of the day, you are owning the underlying equities that are in these covered call ETFs. And if the sectors that you're buying covered calls on goes down your ETF will also naturally go down with it, despite the fact that you're getting a bit of um, alpha by also cashing in on the premiums. You can see over the long term, despite the you know shorter or worse shorter term uh, performance, over the long term, getting 8% back a year is pretty solid for a relatively um, conservative play that, mi that minimizes volatility. So I'd say over the long term, this ETF has performed um, pretty well. Looking at the sector and geographical <laughs> allocation, it's obviously 100% um, in financials and 100% in Canada. Some of the stocks they own here, TD, National Bank, Scotiabank, CIBC, everything you'd expect from a Canadian uh, bank ETF for the most part. And trying to get back the stock price so we can take a, a quick look at that. And it's not cooperating. So maybe we'll come back at the end, but I don't want to, oh, no, I don't want to hold you guys hostage on that. Going into the next ETF here, this is the second last one we'll be talking about. It is Harvest Diversified Monthly Income ETF, ticker HDIF. This one is one ETF that actually uses a lot of um, leverage. They leverage about 25% of the portfolio. And what does that do? I think... Essentially, what that does is they're paying whatever the interest rate is for the leverage, call it 4%, 5%, depending on when you're watching this video. But then they lever up the equities they own and the premiums that they're getting. And like you saw in the other ETFs, you can get 9%, 10% immediate yield when you're covering high dividend uh, stocks with covered calls. So you're also getting the the difference or the spread in what the current interest rate is plus what the dividend plus um, premium is 
and that's adding to the yield. So this is much more risky, has risk of interest rates going up and needing to service that debt that it's taking out to buy more equities. Usually if interest rates go up, stocks go down as well, so you get hit from both sides. But the benefit of it is you do get a higher monthly dividend yield. So it all depends on the risk that you're looking to take. This is also a collection of all of the ETFs that Harvest holds. You can see since they launched this ETF um, about 18 months ago, it's down 21%. In the last year here, down about 9%. But I believe they do pay about a 12% dividend yield. So we'll get into that in a minute. They are really well diversified. So they have financials, information technology, healthcare, consumer discretionary, utilities, communication services, all over 10% of the ETF. And they are also pretty diversified in terms of geography as well, because you can look at the types of ETFs they're holding within this ETF, and it's the brand leaders income ETF. This has lots of uh, big CPG companies. It's tech companies in there. It's Canadian equities. It's healthcare leaders around the world, which is probably similar to Ticker Life that we looked at earlier. It's the global utility ETF that we just looked at. It's travel and leisure. You have U.S. banking. So you're really covering tons of sectors and geographies around the world within this ETF. Um, I almost love, wish they did this one with without the leverage just to provide a bit more um, conservative uh, ETF option with this level of diversification in terms of a covered call, but it is what it is. In terms of the distribution yield, you see they're currently paying about 11%, over $0.07 cents a share, and the stock price is um, about seven seventy. So really good dividend yield you're getting at least if you want to take the risk and hold a stock like this, but it doesn't come without its risks as well. Just going to go back, backtrack a bit to the Canadian uh, cover call ETF for banking that we um, looked at, oh, this one here, that we talked about uh, when it was loading. So you see in the last year, down 10%, last five years, down 14%. Now, if I was just going to compare this to some of the banks to show you like how the relationship between the equities and the covered calls go. You can see here in the last year, Scotia Bank down 12%. If I go TD over here, TD Bank in the last year is down about 7%. If I go CIBC, CIBC in the last year, about 15%. So you can see that the general equities are follow are being followed um, or following the the stocks that they own, right? And uh, cover calling TF, while you may get a bit more upside uh, in terms of the premiums you're getting paid out, the underlying equities in the stock price is really indicative of what the sector that you're buying in is doing. So lots of people look at that ETF and say, this is why I don't like cover call ETFs. Um, they're, they keep trending down. I keep losing capital on them. Well, that typically is the case if you're buying ETFs in a space or a sector that the underlying equities are also losing capital appreciation or going down in stock price. So you just have to pick your sectors very wisely and know what you're getting exposed to and be comfortable with your exposure in terms of the sectors, the geographies that you're buying your covered call ETFs in. Okay, going on to um, the last ETF we have here. It is... Hamilton Utility Yield Maximizer ETF. So this ETF here down about 6% since it launched. Looks like it's it's honestly just about four or five months old here. Uh, but looking into this one, this one actually had the highest dividend yield out of all of the stocks that I looked at. So looking at the starting yield at 13.5% or all of the cover call ETFs that we're reviewing today. It's some cover call ETFs, super risky, that are paying 15, 20%. Um, but I'm, I'm not reviewing those in, in this video. So 13.5% should be healthy of enough of a yield um, for someone who's an income-focused investor. You can see the type of stocks that they own in the underlying ETF. You have CP Rail, CN Rail, Waste Connections, Pembina, Hydro One, Enbridge, BCE, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of, um, lots of utility companies, all of them Canadian one of the reasons why this company is able to generate such high dividend yields on a month-to-month -month basis and current yield is because they actually write covered call ETFs on about up to 50% of the portfolio. So lots of the ETFs that we just looked at, they'll write covered calls on about 30% of the portfolio, 25 to 30%. 
And what that ensures and what they're managing when deciding what percentage of the portfolio to, call, to write covered calls on is the more percent of the portfolio you write covered calls on, the more premiums you get, obviously, and the higher dividend you can pay out now. But in the same breath, the more covered calls you're writing on your portfolio, if the, your portfolio goes up in value or when your portfolio goes up in value, it's the more capital appreciation that you're unable to realize on your underlying equities. So this is a strategy that is almost like a covered call strategy on steroids where you really can't expect to get capital appreciation even if the underlying equities have capital appreciation just because you've pretty much sold most of that away to begin with and you better enjoy the dividend yield you're getting month to month and reinvesting that smartly throughout your portfolio because that is really all the return you can be expecting. If anything, you should just be hopeful that the stock doesn't go down or the, the equities don't go down because you realize when the equities go down, but when the equities go up, 50% of the upside is completely eliminated by the trade-off of getting that premium um, covered call dividend on a monthly basis. So pros and cons to each of these ETFs. This one is a bit more aggressive in terms of how much they write and therefore minimizes the upside in the equity price even more um, in terms of the cover call stock. But you do get that juiced up dividend yield of about 13.5%, so significantly higher than some of the other ones we were looking at, 8%, 9%. You do get more off the top. Another interesting thing on this one, while they do write cover call options on significantly more of the portfolio. It calls out here that they do not use leverage. So that's a bit of a plus. They could go even farther and use leverage and write cover calls on a big portion of the portfolio. Um, but that would be a very risky strategy um, because in that world, it would be so many drivers that are degrading the the price of the, the ETF and the share prices that it may not be sustainable. When you add in the management fee, on top of that, you have the stock going down when it goes down, but not really going up in times that the market's going up. Um, and on top of that, you may have increased interest payments if interest rates go up. That's like a lot of things that are putting downwards pressure on the net asset value of a stock. So I like that they don't use leverage at least. Makes it, <laughs> I almost don't even want to say the word conservative, but makes it a bit more conservative than um, doing so while they're writing 50% covered calls. So those are six cover call ETFs that are traded on the TSX that you may want to consider for adding income to your portfolio. To give you a bit of sense of what I do personally or how I use uh, cover call ETFs in my portfolio. So I do have a handful of cover call ETFs that I was building up as I was trying to get my dividend income on a monthly basis up. And I should probably mention that every single one of these cover call ETFs pay out on a monthly basis, which is nice, especially for people with fixed income or people looking to per get some fixed income to pay bills on a monthly basis. But I was really just wanting to get my monthly income up to a really healthy spot, started leveraging some of these covered calls that we talked about in today's video. And I'm at a spot right now where I really love getting that income, that couple hundred bucks a month, give or take, from my covered call ETFs. But I'm not reinvesting in these covered call ETFs because I think there's strong opportunities in the market on equities and, and other equities that I'm buying that I think will have stronger long-term capital appreciation as well as long-term dividend growth. So I'm grateful to have a portion of my portfolio, um, let's call it uh, maybe 10%, a bit less than 10% of my portfolio that are in these types of covered call ETF investments. But at the end of the day, I really just use the income that are derived from them as a tool to accelerate my investments in some of my core dividend stocks and dividend growth stocks, which I think will better serve me over the long term. They're also not the most tax efficient. You're paying a lot of taxes on all these dividends, whereas if I invest that in a equity that I believe will have capital appreciation, I can kind of ride the unrealized gains over the next few decades since I'm still a pretty young investor in the grand scheme of things. So that's how I use cover calls in my portfolio, just as a cash infusion on a monthly basis to accelerate some of my other objectives in my portfolio. But they are a great tool for, um, for someone or can be a great tool depending on what you're trying to achieve with your portfolio, short-term, long-term. 
My only watch out is to make sure you you know what the management fees on your ETFs are and you're comfortable with them going in because you can see they can vary and some of them can get pretty high. So if you like this kind of content, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. It really, really does help with the YouTube algorithm. And if you watch till the end of the video, I really do appreciate it a lot. Not a ton of people get to the very end. So be sure to hit the thumbs up button, consider subscribing to the channel. We'd love to hear what cover call ETFs you may be owning right now or you're looking at in the comments as well and to meet you guys there. Thanks for watching and have a good one.